In his famous article, Art and Objecthood, Michael Fried decried the minimalist movement, especially the work of Donald Judd and Robert Morris, as one that was principally concerned with materiality of objects and their relationship to the space which they occupy. In other words, objecthood. By contrast, art required an aesthetic experience where the materials themselves, as I understand it, were only a means to the end, the communication of an idea, of a form, of an experience, of beauty. But regardless of their standing as art or object, the minimalist work of these literalists, as Fried termed them, challenged the relationship between viewer and the art object, or at least required the viewer to consider the relationship. It is the literalist relationship to materiality and the post-digital rejection of the absence of objecthood within artwork that frames my investigations. It is that questioning of construction that opens up a line of communication between that which we take for granted and the means by which it comes into being. I am an educator at heart and an academic by trade. More than digging into something uh, so that I can understand it, I find that I want to know the details of something so that I can share that which I already enjoy, that which I'm passionate about. It is my hope as I create that both this passion for and understanding of the materials of digital media come across. I find myself fortunate to have grown up, or to have been born into the personal computer generation. Growing up, our game system of choice was the Atari 2600. Our first computer was a Timex Sinclair 1000, shortly followed by an Apple IIc, complete with the four color dot matrix printer and a 2400 baud modem. I attended computer camp, I learned uh, programming basic, and I was active on many local BBSs. Perhaps some of my aesthetic and exploration come from that early experience. Well before we had a computer though, I had a camera in my hand. Whether it was on Instamatic film or disc film or 35 millimeter film, I documented everything. Every family vacation, every school trip, everything. During the summer before my 10th birthday, I stepped into a dark room for the first time, and I was hooked. I was much more interested in the developing of the image than the actual shooting of it. When I returned to photography during college, I found the same passion for being in the dark room as when I was first introduced to it. It took more than 25 years for me to bring these two interests together, and nearly another 10 for me to, under, to begin to explore why. For me, technology and photography were two different worlds. Graphics were intangible, photography was material. Computers were for work, communication, entertainment, but photography for me felt real. I despised my electronic imaging class. Uh, I was convinced that I could uh, produce any Photoshop trickery in the darkroom. And the more that I considered this and the more that I rejected the digital, the further my photography moved towards the traditional black and white, semi-documentary, hand-processed and printed. I looked for more ways to work with my hands and found myself uh, taking a job in a book conservation lab and preservation department of a major research library. Uh, and this was just at the time that libraries began juggling, uh, I'm sorry, it was at this point in time that the discussions of digital preservation and access were becoming accelerated. Libraries began juggling the desire to make materials available to more patrons while at the same time expressed concerns for the physical storage of those materials. I found myself reading articles and newsgroup posts regarding the stability of digital media and the needs to develop digital asset management policies. When I returned to graduate school, digital imaging was firmly entrenched as a creative method. Photography was on the fast track away from the darkroom. Having recently been moving towards the more traditional techniques, I felt cre uh, compelled to create work that engaged the questions of permanence within the digital realm. 96, 33 to 95 became that investigation, and in hindsight became one of my first explorations of materiality, both physical materiality and digital materiality. In 96, 33 to 95, I chose to use ice melting at room temperature as a metaphor for the slow disintegration of data and the digital media improper, oh, I'm sorry, the slow disintegration of data and digital media improperly stored. A pan of ice chips colored white or black were organized and filmed over a period of an hour. Still images from that video were then exported and manipulated. Harkening back to my pre-graphical internet days, I employed UU encoding, which some of you uh, former Usenet users might remember as a means to exchange images. Uh, uh, and I used that as a means to transcode the JPEG images into a usable format. 
Uh, the title of this project comes from the ASCII character set that was used in UU encoding. These 60 character strings covering tens of thousands of lines revealed patterns within the JPEG and I began experimenting with those changing patterns. The more I manipulated the data, the more degraded the image became when it was transcoded back into the JPEG. While the disintegration of these JPEGs was important, the means in which this material was presented and archived for me became more important. The installation of the work presents the passage of time horizontally and an increased degradation of data vertically. Each print is a chemical print rather than an inkjet print, archivally mounted to an inert substrate. And while chemical color prints do have a limited lifespan, slides which have a much more significant lifespan were also created for this project. The limitless possibilities for degradation of an image in this manner became daunting, and at the urging of a mentor, I looked for ways that were not just easier for me, but as he put it in his words, ones that would let the viewer have the fun of disrupting the image. This led me to explore the means in which an image could be translated into something other than text. Pipeline, in essence, was like stepping into the middle of a giant fax machine. An image projected on one wall was transformed into sounds that were projected through the space at the opposite end of the space. A microphone picked up those sounds and translated them back into image. As it turns out, I became much more interested in the method by which I translated the image into the sound than the experience within the space. Don't get me wrong though, User experience is still pretty high up there on my scale of interests, but the addressing of the screen is a method that stuck with me through much more of my work and something I'm sure I will come back to time and time again. That piece was programmed using MaxMSP. Uh, for those of you that don't know it, it's a graphical programming environment roughly based on the C programming language. Uh, and I was able to consider different input, uh, me different methods of input and led me directly to the piece which was exhibited uh, at, uh, at Artisphere uh, called Pixel Labs. Pixel Labs began as a method of recording an image simply pixel by pixel with the hopes of exploring long exposure photography as the com computer considers the construction of the image. Pixel Labs had given me the opportunity not only to add duration to images but also velocity. Slower captures became more about the space, faster captures became more about the movement and changes in that space. While some of my early experiments were enjoyable, it was the exploration of portraiture and the capturing of the user uh, during the learning process that seemed to be most successful. This, of course, led to the photo booth. It began with the home version that people could run on their own machines, and you were welcome to visit the site and download it for yourself. Uh, and uh, eventually moved on to a full-size installation, full-size photo booth installation at the University of Maryland in 2008. And this is the documentation from it. And the sound's not. So in this initial installation, there was a screen on the inside of the booth as well as on the outside of the booth. So there was this element of privacy, but at the same time, you were broadcasting your experience inside. documentation of the exhibition, so I'll pop forward. Uh, in 2009, I was invited to show this work at Artscape in Baltimore. Uh, it would not allow me to really create a giant photo booth on the street, 
uh, so created a much more compact version, which is what I've been trekking around uh, in uh, most recent times and uh, brought to uh, Artisphere. Now, this project used the same uh, method as Pipeline, a simple scanning line by line, pixel by pixel. Uh, and uh, this time used a webcam as an interface. So the process of long exposure uh, photography became revealed. Uh, this, of course, led to creativity on the part of your users. These are some of the greatest hits through the history of the photo booth. And these are some that came from the most recent exhibition. The final project that I want to show you this evening is uh, what uh, has the potential of involving the viewer, but at this point in time, it's still just my exploration, my investigative process. Uh, having invested so much time in considering how the pixel is placed on the screen and watching people interact with the photo booth, trying to intentionally put pixels in various places on the screen, uh, basically exploring the capture process on their own, I began to consider how unbiased the computer and by extension the screen is. The entire goal of the machine is to display pixels and display uh, different pixels in places where something has changed over time. This is essentially the basis of DVD MPEG encoding, and though the P-frames and I-frames as well as the MPEG-2 uh, compression itself is far more intricate than what I'll present. Uh, glitch art and data moshing have been especially interested in harvesting this technology for creative purposes, but I am again interested in the pixel and I was interested in the simple addressing of the screen. this being my tribute to the Lumiere brothers. Uh, in reductive video, as I've begun calling it, each frame of video is analyzed with the previous one. Uh, each frame is then reduced only to the advancing or new pixels. And by displaying only the new pixels, the video itself is reduced only to the important elements uh, needed to describe movement. Um, in this case, a camera set on a tripod could explore movement within a space without revealing that space itself. My imaging background, though, began to creep up on me again. While the video was, that I was producing were interesting explorations of space, I desired, desired something tangible, so I rewrote the programming to also compile all of the pixels in, uh, presented on the screen into a single image to see what would happen. So through reductive video, I began exploring both locations as well as activities. And in this case, uh, took a piece of footage that I had filmed uh, on vacation one summer and began processing it, looking for the minimum that that's necessary. As I began to watch these works uh, and then also influence somewhat, uh, or at least my memory jogged somewhat by the, uh, the Moybridge exhibition that was at the Corcoran in uh, 2010, I realized that I was exploring similar ideas. I was exploring movement. I was exploring differences in movement. Um, both Moybridge and uh, Etienne Jules Murray were concerned with the efficiency of movement, exploring how a body moves. So I stepped into that myself. This is one of our soccer players up at UMBC who graciously let me film her in the studio.
while Moybridge was segmenting his work into moving parts, which I find akin to the video, Marais was layering movement one over top of another. And that is why I started to bring both of those together, both the print and the video. pretty much said everything that's up there. <laughs> So this is my current trajectory, looking at, continuing with these ideas of pixels, but looking at this description of motion, um, and will likely take me quite some time, whether I choose to explore all of Moybridge's entire catalog of animal locomotion, or try to look with something more contemporary as yet to be seen, um, and will likely run parallel with a uh, number of artistic ventures. Um, but I think it's fitting that I leave you with this exploration, the reductive video. It, like much of my other work, is an attempt to simplify the impact of technology on the still and moving image. It is my attempt to bring some tangibility back to the intangible, or at least some level of objecthood. Thank you.